Remain standing just a moment and bow our heads for a word of prayer. And now, as our heads are bowed and our hearts, I, I wonder, this being the night that we have set aside now for, for the night of salvation, for coming to Christ and receiving the Holy Spirit, I wonder how many has a request that would like to say this, Lord God, remember me. I want to be right with you now. Would you raise your hands up? Lord bless you. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your presence and for honest-hearted people who really believe that, that you are coming and they, they must make ready for this great event that the whole world has waited for all these thousands of years. And we're living just as it was watching time and history run out and eternity beginning to move in. And we see this appearing so our hearts are strangely warm. And we pray, Father, that you'll search our hearts tonight and try us. And if there be any sin in us, Lord, take it out. We have noticed this week in your great presence as we've watched you over this and among this congregation going right down and digging out the very thoughts of the heart and revealing it to us, telling us these things. Now tonight, Lord, we, we want our hearts to be true and right with you. We pray that you'll bless. Here upon the platform or the pulpit has been placed a box of handkerchiefs, little parcels that's going to the needy. I pray, Heavenly Father, as, as they're sent from this place where prayer has been made and faith to believe, God, that that every handkerchief here and every uh, little cloth and parcel that touches the sick, may they be healed because this audience and we together are asking in one accord that you will heal them, Father. It's a memorial that we have asked. You said, ask and you shall receive. And when you pray, believe that you receive what you ask for. I believe, Lord. We all believe. And it's been asked now, let it be done. For the kingdom of God's sake, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Let me be well, it's certainly good to be back at the, at the auditorium again tonight and under great expectations for the Lord to visit us tonight as we've set this night aside from praying for the sick to the... Uh, to seeking salvation for our souls. Uh, each one of us needs to rededicate our lives anew. And this week we have seen the presence of Jesus Christ, the vindicated scripture, him right here among us, watching what he did, the same things that he did on earth when he was here before. He's doing it just the same. Now, have we seen the ministry as it's climbing, just like we're growing into a perfect day, a perfect church. We started out just like, like we were saying this morning in our lovely little fellowship this morning. We certainly had a wonderful time at that breakfast. I thank the brethren for their fine cooperation. I got to shake the hands of many of them. These fine men that's sponsoring this meeting, uh, bringing us in here to... It shows that they're interested in their people, their shepherds, and interested in their sheep. And so I'm, I'm grateful that some of this, uh, uh, any shepherd is interested in getting his sheep uh, with vitamins. And these are spiritual vitamins, as it was. It, it helps the sheep to grow into strong faith in our God. And so I, I appreciate such man. And now... Speaking this morning on the thought of the church growing, see, coming like a seed in the ground. And that seed, as it's planted, grows from glory unto glory. And it becomes, after a while, into a blossom. And then goes back to the seed. And that's like the original seed that was planted. And so has the church been. The church age started in this last days. After the dark ages, it started with Martin Luther. In the Reformation, preaching justification by faith. After his time, and they organized the church, it died out. And then there comes Swingley after Luther. And Swingley didn't even believe in the virgin birth. He went over into Switzerland 
they still don't believe. And the Swingley doctrine do not believe that Jesus was virgin born. They said he was the son of Joseph called the son of God. But that takes the whole prop out from under uh, the whole foundation of Christianity. He was virgin born or he's just a man like you or I. He was the son of God. And then after that come Calvin and on and on. Finally, the church got in such a condition they kind of had to have another reformation. And God sent John Wesley with a message of sanctification, cleansiness of the spirit. And then he and Whitfield and many of them went on in the great reformation in Asbury. They come to the United States and that great revival saved England and the world at that time. What did they do? After them founders died out, they began to organize upon their doctrine. And the first thing you know, they made an organization. Then we had others break off from there, such as Alexander Campbell, John Smith and the Baptist Church and so forth. And then the Nazarene Pilgrim Holiness and others come on. And then come the Great Reformation again. Pentecost coming out of those organizations with the restoration of the gifts, speaking in tongues, divine healing, great miracles and signs come off. That went for a long time. It's been 50, about 58 years now since the Holy Spirit began to fall on Ola Zusa Street out in California. You're in the United States where it started falling. The great time come. Then what did Pentecost do? One made him an organization. One said he's coming on a white horse. Another in a white cloud. And away they went. And organizations and split up. Breaking up the brotherhood among the people. And just like Israel, little did Israel know that when they were shouting the victory on the bank of the river, they were only about four days' journey, about 40 miles, away from the promised land. Amen. They didn't realize they were 40 years it had taken. But what was it? Grace had provided them a prophet, a pillar of fire, a sacrifice lamb, a deliverance. And still they wanted a law. They wanted something they could have something to do into. They want to put their hands to it. That's the most rational mistake they ever made. In Exodus 19, when Israel rejected grace and accepted law. And then what did they do? He just let them stay right there in the wilderness for 40 years. They plant vineyards and they eat fruit and they married wives and they raised children. Till that old generation died off and another generation come on. Forty years later, and not hardly forty hours away, but had to wait for forty years before they went over. And then a new leader came in, Joshua, and they moved on into the land with the new group. Now, I think it's a very beautiful type here that we find out long ago when our forefathers in the Pentecost, they raised up, they had the old general council. From that form, the assemblies of God. Out of that come the UPC and then United and so forth. Till they got organization after organizations fussing and fighting. God just let them sit right there. Marry wives. Raise children. Speak in tongues. Shout in the spirit. But now there's a new group come up. They were only just a few days from the promised land. All these blessings they had was fine. But you remember the whole land belonged to them. Now... We're fixing to go into the promised land. So may the Lord help us as we look upon these things. See? Just like the pyramid. Did you notice how the pyramid was made? Not a pyramid doctrine now. Just a pyramid. Look on your one dollar bill. The seal of the United States is that eagle. Well, why does it say over there on the pyramid the great seal? Why would it be greater here in the United States and, and the seal of the United States? The great seal. The eye watching in the... The capstone that goes upon the pyramid was, it was rejected. It never was on the pyramid, isn't to this day. The stone of scroll they claim, but it never was put on the capstone. Why? When Enoch and them in the early days built the pyramids down in Egypt, we find out that in there they knew that the cornerstone, the capstone would be rejected. And that pyramid is put so perfectly together till they don't need mortar. It was so mechanically hewed out until one stone fits against the other so tight you can't even put a razor blade between them. Now, it's kept heaping up. And now it's all honed off on top, ready for the capstone when it will come. That's the way God's brought His church. From justification, sanctification, baptism, the Holy Spirit. And now the ministry of the Spirit, which is the what quickens the Word. 
That ministry in the church will have to be just exactly like this. Just like this. When my shadow here of my hand, if I never see my hand, see the shadow, it's kind of, it gets pale as it gets away, but as it gets closer and closer, the negative and positive are coming together until they both become the same thing. Amen. And that's exactly when the church and the word has to be one like Jesus and God was one. Just exactly that God has was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And so will Christ have to be in the church, the anointed of the word to make everything fulfilled. And that's a capstone that comes upon the last church age. To, not the lady will see it now. It's a calling out of that. A bride out of a church. Church out of a church, in other words. It's like he called a nation out of a nation in Egypt. And now we're living in that day. And we're grateful for these great things that we've been seeing. Now, tomorrow afternoon, the Lord willing, is going to be the closing of this service, uh, of this part of the service. And uh, we're going to designate that all together for praying for the sick. And everybody that wants to be prayed for may come out and get a prayer card to come through the prayer line. Now, the reason we give prayer cards on these is keep them lined up. And then if you don't, they just keep passing around, around, around. See, they, so you, we give them a prayer card. You have a prayer card. You come in the line and you'll see and believe you'll see the glory of God take place. It'll be great. And now we thank you for all that you have done and for the great welcome that we've had amongst these ministry brothers and so forth. Now, tomorrow is Sunday and these churches will be open. There'll be no service here tomorrow morning. There'll be Sunday school. And you visitors, I've got some friends in here myself. At, uh, it's with us in a party, and some has come down from my hometown um, here to be with us. Now, these are the men that sponsors this meeting. They believe this type of meeting. If I lived here in this city, I'd belong to one of their churches. I certainly would, because they believe the same thing that I believe. And I'd belong to one of their churches if I lived here. And you have gave your life to Christ this week, and you don't have a church home, why don't you talk it over with them? They believe this same thing, or they wouldn't be sitting up here representing See, So now you, uh, you, you find you a nice, one of these nice churches tomorrow and go to it, and I'm sure they'll do you good. They'll help you. They'll help you to believe. And if you haven't been baptized, ask them. If you haven't received the Holy Ghost, ask them about it. And they'll help you right on through to Christ and shepherd you right on down the road until he returns. Now, the Lord bless each one of you. And now, you know, the Presbyterians are always raising up and setting down, they say. And I'm not a Presbyterian, but I do believe that when we read the word, we ought to stand. Because it's an honor to God to stand. It's like we salute the flag or pledge allegiance or what more. And now, for tonight, I have chosen some scripture reading here. Out of the book of St. Luke, the 7th chapter, beginning with the 36th verse. And now, all week long, I've been working on a, a thought that come to me on the road coming down here on the unveiling of the mighty God. But when I got through looking at my scriptures and things, I had nearly 20 pages. <laughs> so I never get through that in no hour here. So I thought I'd have to change it tonight. So I have I believe it's will of the Lord that I say these things. Now, in 7th chapter of St. Luke and the 36th verse, one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, remember, not out loud, within himself, saying, if this man was a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is that touched him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. 
There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, and they owed the one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house. Thou givest me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with tears and has wiped them with the hairs of her head. And thou givest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman has anointed my feet with oil. Wherefore I say unto her, I say unto thee, her sins, which were many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him begin to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins? Also. And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, this story has taken place many years ago but it's a true story for it is written in the pages of our bible and we know that it's true and now we would by no means try to portray this again tonight but we would like for you to help us to bring this as a message tonight to the people that they might see that that you're still the same Lord Jesus. And we pray for your blessings upon us all as we are needy people. We have need of thee, Lord. And we believe tonight, though we see you make the blind to see and the deaf to hear and the lame to walk, and and by doctor's statements have seen you raise up five people from the dead in different times different nations but yet Lord I believe the most sickest thing I know of tonight is the body of Christ here on earth the church it's really sick heal it tonight Lord this potion that sets here together this this bunch of sojourning here in, in Tampa this lovely bunch of people Lord heal every wound tonight Let the Spirit grant this to us. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for His honor, for His glory here in this city, for we are journeying. Amen. Be seated. I should call it now just for a few moments. And I'm trying not each night. I have to apologize to you because you've been so nice and you're such an easy audience to preach to. Uh, you just don't know when to stop. And that makes the minister know that you're feeding or receiving the words that I'm saying. And I'll come to you when I've been, I'm the tardiest I've ever been and I don't know when. See, I haven't let up since Christmas. I'm going right from here to Tucson to start again. Come right from there to go to British Columbia to baptize a whole tribe of Indians that are led to Christ who were formerly Catholic last fall when I was on a hunting trip and the whole group gave their heart to Christ by the healing of the mother, one of the mothers. That the doctors, no one could touch her. She's laying dying. And they want me to come back as soon as the ice gets melted. See, it gets 85 below zero there. And so, and the ice melted. I'm taking them and all a great bunch of trappers and hunters up and down the Alaskan Highway are all meeting with me to be baptized and accepting Christ. 
They seen the Lord show a vision of a certain thing where a certain bear would be, how much he'd weigh, what kind he was, and where a certain animal would be staying, how, who would be there, and what they'd be wearing, and all about it. And told them before it happened, and they said, it's not even that kind of things in this country. And we went right straight to it and happened word by word. Amen. The trophies hangs in my room today. They said, we want to be baptized too. Rough man. But you know... He's got seed laying everywhere. My subject tonight is Jesus keeps all his appointments. I want you to bear that on mind as we speak. And I, I won't talk too long. And I want you to think it over now. That Remember, you've got to meet this one that's present with us tonight someday. Now, it must have been almost sundown. When our sitting starts out tonight, it must have been about sundown. And this courier had run all day, maybe two or three days. He was trying to find him. He went down maybe almost from Dan to Bathsheba. Because Jesus in his ministry was going to speak here, perform his signs and wonders. And the people were all together. He would take off somewhere else. I must go to another city. And he'd had a hard time. Perhaps it went over to Capernaum and they said, well, he left here a week ago. We don't know exactly where he went, but he went somewhere else and he had, oh, he was tired. His hair was wet with perspiration. His legs were dusty and sweaty. And as he come up into the party where Jesus had been speaking, and Jesus also was tired. He'd been speaking all day. His mouth was dry from much speaking. And his hands began to look trembly. And his eyes weary as the sun began to sink. And he wanted to see Jesus. He had a message for him. And now Jesus had 12 men around him that kept the people away from him. Uh, of course, he just uh, coming up on him. And so they... I'm making this in a drama so that everybody can catch it. And so we find that in this Jesus man, he must have come, let's say he come to Philip. And Philip might have said something like this, uh, uh, Sir, a young fella, we would certainly like to let you see the master, but, but he's so tired, we, we just got to watch him because he, he just goes till he almost drops. And we've been in so many meetings and so forth lately. To, uh, I'm sorry, I don't believe we can do it. But he says, I, I have a, a note here that comes from a very important man in religious realms. And it's an invitation for your master, which will be a great, a great thing if, if he shall go. And I must see him because I've been commissioned that I must take this note to him and see that he gets it personally. So finally, it, they took him up to the Lord Jesus. And while he was uh, looking at him, the Lord Jesus, perhaps leaving his place, pulpit from where he was speaking, where the disciples and them had fixed for him to talk from. As he was looking, why, he looked upon the young man. He must have uh, uh, liked him. And the young man told him, he said, I am on an a errand, sir. And there's a very... Uh, high-ranking man down in a certain city. And he's a Pharisee, the strictest of the religions. And he's, uh, he's making a, a dinner, a great uh, time, a banquet. And he wants you to come to be the guest of honor. And he's a uh, man he would like to attend this banquet. But he has selected you, and I've been three days trying to find you across the country. And I was certainly happy to get here, sir, and I'll deliver this note to you from it and from him. And he took the note and read it, and he find out that this certain Pharisee had was making a feast and, and had bid him to come down and be a guest of honor with him. So Jesus standing for a few moments and looking at the young man, and yet as busy as he was, but you can never invite him but what he'll come. I don't care what the situation is, he'll come. He uh, said, you tell your, your master that I'll be there on this certain day, at this certain time, I'll be there. 
And the courier must have smiled, satisfied, and turned away and run off down the hill to take the good news back to his master that he had succeeded in getting the message to this one that he wanted. What was the matter with that courier? How could it be? Was he conscious of what he'd done? The first time maybe in his life that he ever stood in the presence of Jesus and never even asked forgiveness of his sins. He never, he never took the opportunity. Oh, how... It's the same way with people today. Many times they they realize that they're in His presence and and never ask forgiveness. Well, that he he maybe never presented the opportunity another time and turned down his last opportunity to ask forgiveness. How could he ever have done that? How could this boy ever so been wrapped up and bringing this message from his master that he? Failed in the presence of the Son of God to ask forgiveness. It was all a business affair. And you know, that's something like the people today. Church Christ has become a a, a business affair. Or social affair. To join church and get just a, a, a little better social standing for your business or something. To stand out a little better in the neighborhood. It is the thing of, of really coming and repenting like a, a sinner should do. Many times in church, people are brought right in the presence of Christ. And turn away and do as rational a thing as this courier uh, did. Oh, he should have fell upon his knees when he first realized that it was who he was. And he's saying, Master, I have a message for you, but at first, I want you to forgive me. Amen. That would have been the right approach. And then if there's any business to be done, let that be done later. But to first, get his own soul right with God. That's why I think so much healing becomes a failure. Or professed healing because the first place, the people are not ready for healing. They won't confess their wrongs. The Bible said, confess your faults one to another and pray one for the other. And we're not willing to do that. If we can take the healing and go ahead and go on back and do what we was doing, they would accept that. But when it comes to really first coming and getting right with God, people don't want to do that. And that's the reason it throws a, a bad... A damper over divine healing. You see so many people that walk in like that and walk out and don't. And God knows all about those things. Now this fellow made a real rational thing, we would think. We would think, if I could only take his place. If I could go up before his throne and, and take a message, the first thing I would do, what would you do? Be interested in what your organization has sent you up there to find out about or would you be looking around to see how heaven was decorated? Or in his presence would the first thing you'd say, Lord God, forgive me a sinner. Amen. That would be the right thing to do. Now, as Jesus watched the boy and as he went away, it might come in his mind, why didn't that boy do that? Well, it's because he wasn't conscious who that was. May I say this not sacrilegious? May I say this not because it's this meeting or any meeting, but I think that's what's the matter today. People are not conscious of it. They see the scripture exactly identified, but they're not conscious of who it is. They'll see something and they'll say, oh, that was wonderful. That was fine. But you're not conscious of what it is. If it was, there would be a repentance going on, weeping and crying. Amen. The city would have such a revival to half of you be locked up before morning. That's right. If we'd be conscious of what it is and we pass by many times and miss the opportunity. Please. But not being conscious. I don't think the boy really realized he'd been raised up among this Pharisee, which was a, a, a great ruler, a prince or, or a religious man. And he'd been raised up with him and... And, and this took his side of religion. And the Pharisee had, had laughed at Jesus and made fun of him or something. They did as they, 
And that day, and th- he just throwed it off. That wasn't nothing but just an ordinary message he had to deliver. He just sat there and he was in his presence and that was all it was to him. It didn't mean nothing to him. But if he had been conscious, that boy could rise up from the dead today and sit in this meeting this week. He would have done something about it. He would have a testimony that would have shook us all. Amen. But he wasn't conscious. Now, in the scene here, there's something wrong. It just isn't, it isn't right. As Jesus watched that boy go away tired and weary, but the whole setting, there's something wrong. Them Pharisees hated Jesus. Why would they invite him for a guest of honor when they hated him? That Pharisee had a, as the old uh, gambler's expression, he had a Something up his sleeve. He had a trick card in his sleeve because they hated Jesus. Now, I believe Jesus realized that right then. See, people must have things in common. My mother, she used to have an expression, birds of a feather flock together. You don't see, you don't see buzzards and doves feeding together. They're, they're, one's a scavenger. And the dove couldn't eat the buzzard's food because he don't have any gall. He, he couldn't digest it. And you don't see believers and unbelievers together unless there's some kind of a purpose for it. There's something, something wrong. This guy had a trick up his sleeve. He wanted to play it on Jesus. Now you take people like you take young people, young teenage children... They don't like to be around the old folks because they, they have things in common. The young married couples, they have things in common. The old people, they don't want to be around the kids so much. They, they got things in common. When you see a little girl hanging with grandma all the time, now nah, there's, there's something wrong there. There's too much difference in their age. She's either grandma's pet or grandma's got a sack of candy somewhere. See, there's a, there's a trick somewhere. Now, I got a grandchild myself and I know there's a little trick somewhere, see? And you see her hanging around Grandma. Grandma's got a, a sack of candy or something. So this Pharisee had something up his sleeve. It all happened at a ministerial meeting where they gathered together and the subject was discussed about this fellow who called himself a prophet. And they didn't believe he was a prophet. Because they couldn't see a man that wouldn't go along with them and all their doctrine that could be a prophet. And so in this ministerial meeting, they had decided that he wasn't a prophet. And this old Pharisee was going to prove it to him that he wasn't a prophet. The Pharisee was going to, to, to make it sure and to show the congregation, all the people in that city, that he wasn't a prophet before he ever visited the city. He had never been in that city before. So before he come, he's going to expose him. All oh, that spirit, it still lives. Go to expose it. Do something to hinder the meeting that he would have had there. So we find out that he said, I'll make a dinner. And I'll invite everybody and get everybody in the city around. And then we'll prove that he's not no prophet. We'll prove it. So Pharisee might have thought that if he was doing this, he would have... He would have Got a little, uh, maybe become after a while one of the presbyters or something. It, it, it really made a hit with his group. He was going to make fun at the banquet of the Lord Jesus to prove that he wasn't a prophet. Do Put him on the spot somewhere. Then he would be a big fellow among them. Become some great man. Now we find out that the courier returns back and tells his master, I found him. He promised And he'll be here because I just tell the way he acted. He'll be here. All right. Now the Pharisee waited for this certain time and they know when to make this banquet when everything was just right. Perhaps you'll think in our little drama tonight that that he made it in a time when the grapes was right. If you was ever in Palestine when a grape time or even in California, when them great big clusters of grapes are just bleeding right. The whole uh, 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 country, the valley is just full of of that sweet-smelling uh, odor from those grapes. He knows just when to make it right. So he set that time on a certain day 
they would have this feast. Uh, finally, the time come when the feast was going to be carried on, and he invited everybody to come that he could, to come up, all the celebrity and all the associations and so forth, and all the clubs that was in the city that he belonged to, they was all coming out to his great fine palace that set out high, stood out as an estate there in the city. And the time arrived for this to be done. Of course, the yard was all taken care of and the tables were all set and the banquet room ready. And then, now he's going to have to take care of the uh, his guests when they come. Any host will do that. So he had to hire some stable boys because some of his hosts would be com- or some of his guests would be coming on uh, chariots and some riding on mules, some walking. So anyone that makes a uh, has a banquet has to make ready to entertain their guests. So Pharisee got everything just fixed up and all of his servants and got them ready. Got the stable boys where they could take the horses and all the fodder and stuff ready for them. And then you had a, an innkeeper or doorkeeper that had to take up the invitations because you, you could not come unless you was invited. And to take up the invitations, he had their names down, ever who was going to be there. And they come, they identified their name and so they could come in. Then let's just look what, had, what they had to do for a while. I've been in the Orients and and maybe many of you has and watch how they do it. It's, it's really striking. And you notice then when everything's taken care of, then when they come in the door, the first thing, the, the keeper of the door asks who they are. And they tell who they are. He looks on his list and here's the name. Then he checks it. Now what he does, he takes his staff, sets it in the corner. The, the boys takes the horses if he's walking or if he's on the horse and puts it in the stable. Now the next thing he does, he enters into a hall. And in here there's a bunch of a man, what's called the feet washers, the flunkies. It's the lowest paid job there is, is a foot wash flunky. And to think of it, we who think we're somebody and our Lord identified himself on earth as a foot wash flunky. That's exactly what he did. And then we think we're somebody. We'll run off here to school and get a little uh, education in it and learn to say a few big words and come back and put on a, a suit of clothes and walk out here and want to be called doctor, reverend, or somebody. I was up at a big museum not long ago and looking at some uh, the estimation of a man weighed 150 pounds, how much chemicals there was in his body. You know how much there is when he's all rented up? He's worth 84 cents. <laughs> then you'll put a $10 hat on at 84 cents and a $500 mink coat and turn your nose up if it rained, it would drown you. And then go along taking care of that 84 cents. <laughs> right. Thinking you're somebody. And you don't give a care. You act like it about that soul. It's worth 10 million worlds. The difference, the rational, how we can get. Now, this foot wash flunky. He had to wash their feet. Now, in the, when he traveled in Palestine, the Palestinian garment is a robe. It hangs low. And then the underneath garment just comes to about the calf of the leg here. For the underneath garment. And as the, the animals and the man travel the same trail, the animals, of course, going along the trail, and, and, um, and as, as they travel the same trail, and, and the dust would come up from where the animals had been, and it was a stink in the dust. And it got on their feet when they were perspiring, and their feet was, uh, was shod with sandals. And that would get all full of perspiration and and be wet, sticky, and then this stink from where the animals had crossed the trail, would the Palestinian garment sweeping like a skirt down low would pick up this dust and it would get beneath here and get all over their feet and over their, their limbs and they really would smell like that, that trail where the animals had been. So uh, coming into a, a home like those Pharisees had, they were sent into Persia and got those great big fine rugs and and everything, why well, you wouldn't feel welcome to come in before the host and, uh, and, and then be all stinky like that. So they had a way of taking care of that. They had a, a foot wash flunky. 
And he stayed there. And as soon as you come in and your name was registered, the boys taking the horses or your animals and taking them back to feed them. One group of boys. And then the doorkeeper recognized you by the chart that he had in his hand. And then you're ready for the foot wash flunking. Then you go in, you set your foot up. He pulls off the sandal, sets it up to a place so he'll know where you're at. And on this other side, he has a little shoe. And after he gets to washing your feet, washing it all off real good, all the dust and everything, make you fresh. Then he puts on this little cloth uh, a shoe that goes over like you see in airplanes and crossing over overseas now. They give them to you at night when you, like uh, the women have those little uh, things they wear when they're not wearing stockings. I see my wife and daughter and them get them sometime. They, it's a little, I, 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 I don't know what they call them, but it's just like a bottom part of a sock, you know, and, and you put it on your foot. There's something on that order on it's a little higher because you don't want to take your old dirty sandal and walk over them rugs in there. So then your feet's washed. Then you got the next thing that takes place. You got this little booty on, I'll call it. And then the next thing that takes place is a man standing there with a towel over his shoulder. And he's got some ointment in his hands. And that's a perfumed oil. Now, the direct rays of that Palestinian sun upon your neck, it just blisters you. And another thing, that dust that picks up sometimes get into their beard and in their hair. And this man stands here then with an ointment. And he holds it out in this little pan. You get it on your hands and rub it in your face and over your neck. Then you take this towel and wipe it off, groom your hair. Now, sometimes this is very rare because it really gives a, a wonderful odor. They get it many times from way high in the mountains on a wild rose bush. You've seen a rose after the petal drops off, then it, it gets a little, a little apple-like on it. And out of there, they crush it and get this perfume. It's said that the Queen of Sheba, when she come to Solomon, brought much of this fine perfume of that and give it to Solomon. Very rare, so hard to get into the mountains. And then when they wipe this, their beard, and cross their necks and with this towel, groom themselves, now they're ready to, to meet the host, to meet the one that invited them. See, they wouldn't feel right to go into all that dirt. That's why feet washing. See, they, they, they were smelling bad. And they had to have their feet washed. And with their big old heavy sandals on them, fine rugs, they wouldn't feel right. They'd feel embarrassed. But now his feet's washed. And now he's all groomed. He smells with the perfume that's on him from this ointment, what they call anointing their heads with oil. And rubbed it on their face and then wiped it with a towel. Now he's freshed up. Now the next thing he does, he meets his host, the one that invited him. He feels like meeting him. Now, he wouldn't feel like meeting him with all that dirt on him. So he's all groomed up and ready now. Then the host meets him at the door, and they have a very odd way. And uh, it's still, uh, in some of the churches, a greeting with a kiss. So they take a hand, cross this way, embrace one another man uh, with, with their arms around each other like this, and kiss each other on the neck. And when the host kisses you, you are welcome. That's the welcome kiss. Now, you wouldn't want your host to kiss you with all that old dirt and stuff on, on you. So you had to be cleaned up before you're kissed welcome. But oh, when once you're kissed welcome, you are a full-fledged brother. That's all. You can, today, the only thing you can do like today, you go in the house and you feel at home, you're one of them. He's kissed you, welcome. You remember Judas kissing Jesus? See? Hypocritically. See, because if he kissed him, it was a welcome. It was a friend kiss. Not in the lips, but on the neck. Kiss him on the neck. Now, we notice then that you could go in, if you want to go to the refrigerator, it would be today, and get you a great big sandwich and lay across the bed and eat it. Just make yourself at home. You're welcome. Come in. That's You're all right now. You just feel one of the family now because you're on the inside. Now, you get all this done and anointed and uh, all fixed up. You're kissed welcome. And then you go in, shake hands at the banquet. You meet your friends. The host has done kissed you in. And so you're, you're free now. You just feel like you're one of them. You've been invited. You've been cleaned. You've been kissed welcome. And now you're one of them. Go in and have your fellowship. Now... About this time, I'd imagine 
that roast lamb out there in the barbecue pit in the back was just smelling all around over the country. With them grapes and things you'd imagine, and the poor people standing around the fence, their mouth watering, they wasn't invited in. Just the celebrity to this. So the, the feast was now getting in pretty good sway. Everything is getting along fine. Well, good sway. Now, I'd imagine Pharisee and his, all of his uh, friends is tipping the glass one to another and taking a good healthy drink and, of the very best wines there was in Palestine at the time because they were rich. They could afford it. And they, everybody, the women, their fine jeweled women was over in a corner having their fellowship sitting around on divans and so forth as a custom was in that day. And the man all up having their toast and talking and the priest and all the rabbis and everything having a great time. And the, the, the feast is getting pretty well uh, uh, on the way. And then Jesus... Although busy as he was in his busy schedule, he always keeps his appointment. You can depend on that. Amen. He keeps his appointment. Now, let's look into the room and see what's going on. I can see Pharisee over there tipping his glass and saying, Rabbi, you know what? And the great conversation going on, the businessman talking other business and everything. The banquets and banquets in full swing now. This great feast. But look sitting over against the wall, not being noticed. It was Jesus. He kept his appointment. He come. He always keeps his word. All his promises he fulfills. But notice him. He's sitting over there dirty. I hate to say that. It kills me to say it. But his feet was dirty. He hadn't been anointed. He hadn't been kissed welcome. Though he was invited. That's like some of our modern revivals. <laughs> the Frenchman calls him Jesus. Jesus with dirty feet. Could you imagine it? He was invited and he come. And there he is, he got in some way, and unnoticed he sets over as a wallflower. He was just as much out of place there he is in some of our modern revivals. Yeah. Banquets, so-called religious gatherings. He was out of place. Nobody is paying any attention to him. They were too busy with other things, although he was invited. But he wasn't welcome when he come. What happened to that foot wash flunky? How did he ever miss that opportunity? Yeah. I wish I would have had his opportunity. Oh my. If I knew he'd been coming out, I'd been standing there waiting for him. I'd have, I'd have been ready for it. How did he do it? Now, let's not condemn him too much because we might do the same thing and not know it. He missed him. Oh, my. Notice he comes today to our callings, too. He comes in our midst. Now, I don't want to say this, but I, I must say it. And in our midst, he's understood among us, sitting there just as dirty to the people as he was then. It's exactly right. Call them holy rollers and everything else. And yet we cry for revival. And he comes, and when he does come, we treat him about like they did then. Somebody raise up in the Spirit of God, holler amen or scream or something like that when Jesus happens to pass by. Why the, they put out of the church. Well, they think that's an awful shame to disgrace the church, disgrace the people, when it's Jesus himself passing by. And we can see him come and identify his word and do just like he did then. And today they say it's fortune telling, mental telepathy. 
or some evil spirit before the people he's just as dirty as he was sitting there. Jesus, the word of God. And we do nothing about it. We're too interested in our organization or our, our social standing. We're ashamed to be called by his name. We're actually ashamed of him. They was ashamed of him because he was dirty. The guests didn't know him. And they was ashamed of him because he's dirty. That's the way it is today. They're still ashamed of him because they pile all the dirt that they can up on him. Call it holy rollers and everything else that they can think of. Nobody does nothing about it. There he sits. Dirty feet. Wallflower at the party. Wallflower in a religious meeting. Invited. We asked him to come for a revival. When he comes, we treat him the same way they did there. He come in and identify himself. But nobody wants nothing to do with him. If he can pull some kind of a gimmick or, or, or do some kind of a, a miracle like he did before Pilate, Pilate is the only opportunity he ever had. And he asked him, want to see something done. Want to, uh, let's see some sign. He ought to have repented. That's what this cruel, hell-bound world ought to do tonight. It's repent of their sins. That's what these church members ought to do. Repent of their unbelief. Stand up for him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he identifies himself just like he did then. And the people today take the same attitude that that Pharisee took. Same kind of an attitude. Let him sit. After inviting him, yet they don't want him. They just do it like for manners. He knows it. We done to him today just like they did then. Instead of washing him. Washing is the reproach away. Instead of trying to stand up. Saying you're mistaken. It's the word of God made manifest. It's what he promised. He said he poured out the Spirit in the last days. We're living in the last days. Instead of that, we just kind of sit back like they did. We're afraid to take a stand. What if one of them raised up and said, That's Jesus of Nazareth. I believe he's a prophet of God. You know the reason they didn't do it? Because they didn't believe he was a prophet. And they still don't today. They think he's an educator. They think he's a denomination. They don't know he's still a prophet. That's what they had him down there for in question. That's the same thing he's in question about today. Nobody's ready to take up for him. They just say, well, I ain't got nothing to do with him. I belong to church. There's my pastors and all of them sitting around here. I'm a good person. And Jesus, with dirty feet. Nobody cared. The very Bible. Now we walk up and shake hands, put our name on the book, and the, the Methodists, and they don't want us, we take us over to the Baptists, and they kick us out, we go to the Nazarenes. The one that's kick us out, we go to Tunis, and the two that's kick us out, we go to Trinus. We don't have to put up with none of it. All starchy. That's it's the same way we, and when Jesus comes, we don't even recognize, we don't care. That's the way they do. And yet we're crying, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, and he comes. And what do we do? Same thing they did. Why? If they say anything except it, somebody else will hear and make fun of them. And they let him sit dirty. It's called an evil spirit. You remember Jesus told them one day, when they said, this man does this by Beelzebub. He said, you say that against me to be forgiven, but someday the Holy Ghost will come to do the same thing and one word against it will never be forgiven. <laughs> There we are. Jesus with dirty feet. Could you imagine it? Could you imagine people who claim to love God? And it got so mixed up in their creeds and their denominations and isms. Jesus said, your traditions, you've made the word of God of no effect. There he was there and the word was in effect because it was made flesh. And it was proven exactly that he was the Christ. And the people with their traditions wouldn't let it be effective upon the other people. That's what he was doing. Trying to show it off if 
See, they didn't believe he was a prophet. And yet the Bible said he would be a prophet. The Bible, Moses said, the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet. Deuteronomy 18, 15. And the Bible predicted just exactly what he would do. And here he come doing it among those people. And today we leave him with just his dirty name as he had then. Let him say things against it in the days of miracles, his pastors, no such a thing. When the Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And we're still ashamed to stand out and say something about it. Amen. We're ashamed of our testimony that we, we claim we believe. Instead of washing him, trying to wash him with tears of joy that he's here, we just let him sit dirty. I won't have nothing to do with it. I ain't cooperating with nothing like that. Put my hand on it. <laughs> There you are. It's the same bunch of Pharisees. Just under another name. We again let him set like that for the same reason. We don't believe he's a prophet. We're ashamed of it. Why the same reason? We don't believe it. The people don't know, sir, he can come and do whatever he wishes to. They're setting their ways and there's no need of trying to fool with them. And you know the Bible said they'd be that way? Exactly. The Bible said they'd be that way. Lukewarm. Form of godliness and have no power thereof. Frank. We join up with this educational, polished up group standing there and having our big socials and times and our fine churches and fine decorations. Then Jesus Christ can come in and you let him stay dirty. The word can be made manifest among us and we still walk around and let people talk about it. Oh my. But you know, to hurry with our story, let's change the scene tonight. Let's turn our cameras another way. Way down in the alley. A little old dirty alley. Way up at the top of a little old room that was barred with a bar. The door comes open and a woman steps out. Well... She wasn't very well liked among the people. She was a sinner. And she made her living in the wrong way. So she strolls out down the little old creaking steps. She gets into the alley and she goes down all along the garbage cans and goes out on the street. Well, there's nobody out there. So she begins to wonder what's... Oh, I remember Pharisee up there. Pastor Pharisee, he's uh, giving a big banquet. Everybody's up there. Business will be bad today. So she moses down the street. And as she begins to walk, she said, well, I'll just have to wait till that's over. And she made her living in a bad way. So she is walking down the street. And after a while, her little old hungry stomach smelt that roasted lamb. She said, my, it smells good. Never had anything like that to eat in my life. Maybe been turned out on the street by some parents. You know, a lot of times we think about juvenile delinquency. I think a whole lot of it is parent delinquency. Amen. The kids have been taught to pray and serve God instead of a mama out somewhere at a card party and her religious card party and Amen. dad out at a golf course somewhere and Sister out with Junior out there on the street running around. Maybe things would have been different if it had the old-fashioned prayer altar. The Bible instead of a deck of cards. and Throw that television out the door a long time ago. And it might have been a whole lot different. You all used to be wrong. Go to the picture show the devil. Put it right over on us. He brought it right in our house. She's hungry. She smelt that. She said, my, it smells good. I wonder really how a piece of roasted lamb would, would really taste in a human's mouth. I, I don't know how it would be. I believe I'll just walk up. Now, she couldn't get too close to him because she was a foul woman. They were self-righteous, you see. They all belonged to church. So they <coughs> couldn't get around. Where is that? She was considered a sinner. So as she walked up close and she began to look around, seeing all of them standing there in the water running out of their mouth as they... Gasp, you know, and looking at this ram or lamb in there roasting and all the fine foods and things being packed around in there. What a great time. And she began to look through the crowd like that. 
and her eyes fell upon him. Who's that? He's got dirty feet. Wonder who that wonder if somebody would tell me, say, will you turns away real quick, won't nothing to do with her. She's a sinner. So ask somebody else, finally maybe a little lady that uh, was believing and looking the same way. Said, uh, Madam, would, pardon me, but would you t- who is that sitting there? How did he, that person? Well, he said, you know who that is? Did you hear him talk about uh, that Jesus of Nazareth is supposed to be a prophet? Oh, yes. Uh, is that him? That's him. Well, he isn't washed. I understood that everybody's supposed to be washed before they come in there and anointed. Look at him. Well, it's not right. She had an opportunity presented to her. She remembered a story that someone told her, another woman of her trade. One time up in, in the Samaria, the city of Sychar, had been forgiven of every sin. And she realized that that might be an opportunity for her. So how is she going to get to him now? She seen he was needy and she wanted to serve him and couldn't get to him. That's about the way it is. So she thought, what can I do? He has no anointing. His feet's dirty. Nobody's paying attention. Oh, if I could only get in there. That's the real penitent heart. If I could only get to it. Now she think, get her mind catches something. You know what I believe I'll do? I know. Down the street she goes, just as quick as she can. Down through the alley, up this little creaky steps and opens the door. Goes in there and gets a, a stocking top, you know, and pulls it out. Counts how much money she's got. She said... I, is that enough to buy some anointing oil? Let's see if it is. There's 20 pieces of Roman denaria. Perhaps that's enough. But wait, I can't do that. He's a prophet. And he'll know where I got that money. He'll know how I got it. I just can't do it. So she perhaps laid it back again. And when she laid it back, there was something kept speaking to her heart. But would you let him sit there dirty like that? Would you let the only man that can take away your sins sit dirty when you can ser- give him service? So she says to herself, whether he knows or not, I'm going. And down the street she went and run into a store where this little old hook-nosed fellow sitting in there. And, well, what do you want in here? She said, I want the best alabaster ointment that you got. Not the cheapest. I want the best. She had a special reason. And that's what we ought to do. We are to give Him our best. Everything we are, our youthful life. Not wait till we're old and dying. Give the best we got to Him. And there, she got the very best. He went up and said, let's see how much money that is. And he got the money first. He knew her also. So he said, yes, she had the money. So she, where are you going with this? I have it for a special occasion. So she goes up. Now, she has no invitation. But how does she go to get in? But somehow, if you want to do a service for Jesus, he'll make a way for you to get in. Somehow or another, she got in. And there was Jesus sitting there yet. And she happened to think when she got in there, her heart beating real fast. Oh my, what if he'd happen to turn me down? There's a lot of things to think about. What if he'd come up here and say, Say, you foul woman, what are you doing here in my presence? Know you not that I'm the Son of God? You shouldn't be here in my presence. Her heart almost failed and she thought, what can I do? But I've got to get to him. I can't pass this time. This may be the last opportunity I'll have. And it might be yours too. Look down and her heart began to swell up. She she knows she's in his presence. There's something happens when you get in his presence. She noticed the tears begin to fall off of her cheeks and she was standing there shaking with this box in her hand and, and she fell down at his feet and she thought, I can't look up. I'm so guilty and dirty. I can't look up. So she started crying. They began to fall upon his feet and she began to wash him like that with her hands, wiping, trying to wipe the tears off of his feet and washing his feet with her tears. And after a while, she didn't have no towel to, to wipe his feet with, so her hair was hanging down. And she began to, to wipe his feet with the hair that was on her head. Hey. More than our sisters have a time doing that, they'd have to stand on their head to do it. <laughs> our sisters today. Wonder if, you, wonder if the women realize that God keeps all of his promise. I wonder if you realize that it's totally impossible. For you to get in like that. He keeps all of his promises. 
Do you realize what you're doing when you're doing that? You're denying virtue. The Bible said that if a woman kebobbed her hair, it was even a common thing for her to even pray. If she dishonors her husband in doing so. And remember, it was a woman that broke one commandment of God that caused all this to do that. Do you think one breaking one will get back in? Think of it. Maybe sometimes ministers hasn't gotten nerve enough to tell you. This is one time you're going to hear it. It's the truth. Someone said, well, why don't you leave off them women? A great man told me that not long ago. I said, well, they believe you're a prophet. You teach them how to receive the Holy Ghost and get these great big things and how to, to be prophets and so forth. I said, teach them greater things. I said, how can I teach them algebra when they won't even learn their ABCs? It shows the outside expresses what's on the inside. But you go on and do it anyhow. Why? You're not conscious of it. Amen. There she was with her hair. She began to wipe his feet with it and dry his feet off. She was scared to death. After a while, she picked up this bottle of ointment and she broke it and she tried to hit it and break it and poured it on his feet. And she was crying. And every time she'd cry, she'd reach out and kiss his feet. She got hysterically. When you get in his presence, it makes you hysterically. I got hysterically. Any man ever gets in his presence, that's believes him and has faith in him it'll make you hysterically on the day of Pentecost when he come in the form of the Holy Ghost they got hysterically when you really believe and you know and recognize it's your opportunity and you're in his presence and you're sure of it she'd kiss his feet and cry and wash and white and kiss his feet again you know Jesus if he had moved one foot She'd have jumped up and run out of there. But, you know, he just sat and let her do it. Amen. You know, if you want to do something for her, he lets you do it. It may be all out of order, but he lets you do it anyhow. And he, he was doing him a service, and she was washing his feet, and he just sat there and looked at her. She was afraid to look up, because afraid he'd make her scat. And see, she was washing his feet. It's his opportunity to do something for him. And she was just, now see, when, he, when Jesus spoke back to the Pharisee, he justified her by her works. But when he justified her to herself, he justified by her faith, thy faith has saved thee. He showed the Pharisee what her works was because your works expresses your faith. All right. Now let your hair grow out. <laughs> now, see, it expresses what you believe or not. That's God's word. There's no scripture in the Bible, but what? That's the truth. What do you do it? Now, notice, too much Hollywood in Pentecost. That's what's the matter. Amen. Now we find out that's the truth. It's just too much Hollywood. You watch these things and pattern yourself. A lady said to me not long ago, she said, with a little old tight dress on. I said, won't you take that off being a sister? And she said, well, Brother Bram, they don't make any other clothes. I said, they make sewing machines and they got goods. See? You just want to. I'll tell you why. Let me tell you, sister. <laughs> Thank you. One of these days, you're going to have to answer for committing adultery. You say, well, Brother Brown, I'm just as pure to my husband as I can be. I'm as pure to my boyfriend. That might be so too. But Jesus said, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Amen. And if you've presented yourself out there and that sinner thinks that about you because you presented yourself, that the day of the judgment when he answers for committing adultery, who's guilty? Amen. Think of it. Think of it. That's exactly right. Oh, women, come on back, sisters. Come back to Christ. Brothers, you do the same. And you, man, let your wife do that. And call yourself a man, the head of the house. Notice, we're in a terrible time, friend. And we notice, and here was this little woman kissing his feet and washing his feet and whitening with her hairs of her head. And all at once, old Pharisee over there in the corner, he happened to notice it. Oh my, his righteous indignation rose and his, his big chin swelled out and his face looked like it would burst. Oh my. He said, come here. Look here. Look over there. And he said within his own heart now, in his, in his mind, he said, if that man was a prophet, he would know what manner of woman that is touched him. See if he is a prophet or not. See? He perceived the thoughts that was in his heart. 
And all at once he moved, and the little woman raised to look up, her eyes blaring. He looked over and he said, Simon, he said, I, I, I got something to say to you. <laughs> oh, my. Amen. Here you are, Simon. I got something to say to you. You invited me here. I come on your invitation. You invited me. And when I come to the door, you never wash my feet. And when I come in, you never anointed my head. You let me come in dirty. And you never kiss me welcome. Though you invited me. But this woman here, let her be whatever she may be. She has washed my feet with her tears. Amen. She's wiped them with the hairs of her head. And she has anointed my feet and constantly kissed my feet ever since she's been laying there. Amen. He found out whether he's a prophet or not. Then he said, Simon, I want you to look at something. He said, what kind of, I won't give you a riddle. He said, when a, uh, a much is forgiven, uh, uh, much is love. And he gave him the saying and Simon answered him back. Notice. Simon didn't give him anything to wash his feet with, but he had the best water that could, could be. Just think, the tears of a repentant sinner washing the dirt off of Hallelujah. Jesus' feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tears out of a sinner's eyes washing the dirt from his feet. Oh, man and women tonight, when you see the reproach upon the gospel, and we're so starchy, it would take all the makeup off of her face if we cried a tear. And we look hard when we get on the street. What are you going to be when you face the portals of heaven yonder? And there she was. She washed his feet, kissed his feet, and would anointed him and doing everything as she could because she wanted forgiveness. And all of a sudden, she, she wondered what he's going to do now. He had showed Simon and and that backfired on him. The thing that he said he was a prophet was proved that he was a prophet. Amen. That he was the word of God. Now he's standing there with his face swelled out. He had to grab that little woman, throw her out of the church. But she had got what she asked for. Amen. Amen. I mean, you know what the rest of them said. She got what she asked for. Now he turns to her. Her little heart began to beat real fast. Now what's he going to say? There she is. All of her pretty curls is hanging all down over her waist here and her, her eyes are streaking with tears and her face and lips are all greasy where she's been kissing his feet. Did you put that all on him? She sure looks messed up. But them great big eyes looking to see what's going to say. He said, and I say unto her all her sins which are many are forgiven her. That's it. All her sins are forgiven her. That's what I want to hear. Oh, that's the words that I want. I don't care what the rest of them says. I'm ready to stand in his denomination and declare that he is the word of God. I don't care what they say. Let them put any dirt on it they want to. Say a mind reader, fortune teller, whatever you want to. I'm ready to kiss the reproach from him. It's his word. Certainly... He promised that he is the word just as much today as he was then. He said so. Now, friend, there may be people sitting here that can't agree that he's the prophet. You might not agree that he's a healer. But there's one thing that every church member should agree. He's a savior. And I want to say this before closing. Not long ago, an attorney friend of mine was trying a case of a man and woman that was going to... Um, uh, separate. The attorney was a fine Christian gentleman. He said, don't, don't separate. He tried his best to keep them from it, but no, this determined they was going to do it. Something come up between them. And after a while, he said, well, if you got the home down there, you better go down and divide the spoils because if they have to get down, down, and lawyers and things get into it, you know what's going to happen. They'll take every bit of it. So they went into the rooms to divide up what they had. They went into the parlor they fussed and stewed, I blabbed this and I had this. And they went on in the next room and divided in there. And finally they went up in the attic. They had a, remember they had an old trunk up there. They got in there and began to say, well, this belonged to my mama. This was my mama's. Like that. And they got down in the trunk a piece. Both of them 
kneeling on the floor with their trunk right open, dividing up what was what. And they couldn't agree. That belongs to me. I paid for that. I've done the work. I stayed at home when you did it. Fussing. Finally, they raised up something else, and both of them grabbed at the same time. What was it? A little pair of shoes from a little baby that had been born to that union that God had taken. They couldn't argue. They had something in common. As he held their hands, he remembered that she was the mother of that baby. He remembered she was a mother. She remembered he was a father. And as he held the little shoes in their hands, they pulled one another to each other, put their arms around each other. The divorce case was annulled. Why? They found something they had in common. You might have disagreed with me this week. To see the Holy Spirit come in and confirm these words and things, do I? You might disagree with that. You might disagree with the sick being healed. But we do have one thing in common. That's the blood of Jesus Christ that saves us from sins. Will you wash the dirt from his feet tonight? Let us bow our heads just a moment. Remember, he keeps every promise. He keeps every promise. He promised, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. All your sins are forgiven you if you'll just believe it. Now, with our heads bowed, I wonder how many here will raise your hand and say, Brother Branham, I want to, rest of my life, I want to not let him sit and be disgraced. And I, I have an opportunity like the little woman did. I want to, with my testimony, to wash the dirt from him. Let his precious name, will you raise your hand and say, pray for me, Brother Branham. I, I, God bless you. God bless you. That's fine. Now, Heavenly Father. There were many, many hands that went up here just now. And we see that the name of Jesus Christ has been stomped into the dirt. And everything in heaven's named that. Everything on earth is named that. Every, every church member, every member of the body of Christ is Miss Jesus. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we'll see and understand that tonight. May your grace come upon these people now and forgive every sin. That they know that in your presence now and know that you're here. Let your Holy Spirit teach us all now. And may we be forgiven of all of our sins and our mistakes. And from tonight on, may we be new creatures. Fill with your Spirit. Grant it. May we be conscious of your presence. For we ask it in his name. And while we have our heads bowed, I wonder tonight... Now, I'm talking to sinners and to church members and to backsliders and to those who have not the Holy Ghost. I'm talking to you. Why didn't Pharisee accept him? We keep calling for him. Oh, Lord, when you come when your baby was sick, you call for him. He was merciful, no doubt. When he's about to see that wreck out there, you call to him. He, he lets you get out of it. But I wonder, just wonder... Well, all these things that we ask him and we invite him, then when he comes to visit us like this, wonder if we're just ashamed. to say, well, I've been a member of a church, but I, I want to find him in the baptism of the Holy Ghost tonight. I want him. I need him. I don't care what the rest of the world says about it. I want him. Would you like to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? If you would, I'm going to ask you to do something. I want you to come up here, right here where I am now. Come right down here and stand right at this pit right here by me. Every person in here, every unsaved person first. Will you walk up here and stand here just a minute? If you believe that he hears prayer, will you come here and stand here just a minute now while we sing one verse of a song? What is that softly and tenderly Jesus is calling? All right, with our heads bowed, everybody pray. Come right up here and stand here right down here in this pit. Please. Softly and tenderly Jesus. Come, will you, friend, anywhere you are. Calling for you, Jesus, in this last day, just before his appearing in physical form, now, sitting with dirty feet, are you willing to come take your stand to take the reproach off of his name? Calling, oh, sinner. Get her out quickly now. Make up your mind. Come right on now. We got plenty of time tomorrow's Sunday. Sunday school don't start till 9.30. Come on now. Are weary? Come home. Earnestly.
the tender. Do you realize Jesus is here? the balcony we wait come right on up each one just take your place right down here I just this means your life what happens look at the earthquakes all over the earth shaking the earth again look what's happening everywhere the time is in hand and look the door will be closed after a while and you'll try to get in and can't I talked to a young woman some time ago I was holding a meeting in a Baptist church and I asked her that night to come to Christ and she wouldn't do it. And then afterwards she met me outside and said, don't you never embarrass me like that again. A year later I passed through the street. She was an honorable young girl. I passed through the street, her underneath skirts hanging down, smoking a cigarette, going down the street. She's a deacon's daughter. And I said, hello there. aren't I? She said, hello, preach. Such a slang as that. Hello, preach. I said, aren't you ashamed that cigarette? She said, hey, would you like a little drink out of my bottle? She's half drunk. And I said, aren't you ashamed of yourself? She said, come here, I'll take you to where I stay. I said, aren't you at home? No. I said, what's the matter? She said, take a little drink out of my bottle, I'll tell you. I said, aren't you ashamed of yourself to offer me a drink out of a bottle or a cigarette? She said, I want to tell you something, preacher. You know that night you told me that was my last chance? I said, yes, I remember it. She said, you were right. She said, since then, my soul's been so hard. She said, now here's a remark. It just runs shivers over my back. She said, I could see my own mother's soul frying hell like a pancake and laugh at it. Would you want to get in that stage? Don't you turn him down. So right now, won't you come stand here with the rest of these? Come home. Come home. Turn him away. That's what happened. You remember You'll turn him the last time. Come home. He keeps all of his appointments. And you've got one with him. You're going to meet him at the judgment or meet him here. Call him. so surprised my heart feels real funny I thought today when I was praying had another message I was going to speak on he told me to do that he told me to say that I thought every bobbed haired woman would be standing here at that altar call see you just get so hard and so far away you pass that line between that surging see not hearing the word of God I thought surely it would happen but I guess maybe it's later than I really think. <clears throat> Remember, the blood is not upon my hands. I have not shunned to declare to you the counsel of God the way it is. Remember, there's something inside identifying the outside. Get away from it, sister dear. Brother, get her by the hand and come on up here. Why don't you, why don't you, be, why don't you want to be a real Christian? Why don't you used to live that halfway life and living under condemnation? Don't you do that. See, you would say, well, I, I, I don't care what you do. Your fruits is what you're known by. I cross America constantly. Every year across, it gets worse and worse. So I know there's something wrong. The day of grace is passing by. Don't let that happen to you here in Tampa. You're here in a great big fabulous city where everything's full of glamour, just like Hollywood. The whole world has become contaminated. All on televisions and things is some old vulgar, dirty stuff. And you try to pattern yourself like that. Won't you take Jesus' example? Won't, won't you let him, won't you listen to his word? Won't you do these things that's right? How many in here will honestly say that you know you haven't got the Holy Ghost? Look at yourself in the mirror and know you haven't. No, just look at your own life and the way you do. Not because you belong to church. I belong to Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian. That's all right. I ain't saying nothing against that. But I'm asking you, do you know Christ Jesus? Is he living in you? If he does, he'll identify himself there. If he's there, he's bound to let himself be known. You can't hide him. He stands out. You haven't got the Holy Ghost and you know you haven't. 
Raise up your hand. Be that honest. Say, I haven't got the Holy Ghost. I know I have. God bless you for that sincerity. God will honor that sincerity. If you want the Holy Ghost, won't you come stand here with these now? These penitent sinners here. Won't you come at this time? Come up and stand while we sing again. Say, I want it, Brother Bram. I tell you, that it takes that's you're going to have to have it for the rapture. It's exactly right. Now you remember, do you believe that God speaks to you? You believe that's Jesus Christ? Raise up your hand. If you believe this week you've been in the meetings, you believe it's Christ. All right, then your place is at the altar. Women, shame on you. Man, shame on you for letting her do it. You man out here doing those things. And some of you ministers. That almighty dollar instead of almighty God's word. Let that congregation get that kind of shape. Just because some organization you read the same Bible that I read. It's just shame of yourself. Jesus with dirty feet. And haven't you got the real Christian spunk about you to stand up and take up for it? Look like you should have. God be merciful. I pray that God will send the Holy Ghost and conviction just now that will make this congregation realize where it's set. Are you conscious that this is your opportunity? Are you going to do like that courier did? Pass up your last opportunity? Are you going to do that? Don't you do it. If there's a doubt anywhere or something wrong, take your place right down here. Take your place. This is your place. Say, well, I don't want no need. It won't either. They could have went over seeing sitting there. They could have went and identified themselves, but it's against their congregation. What about it wasn't against him? That little woman didn't care. She knows she is a sinner. She got forgiveness. I don't know what happened. Where are they at tonight? Where's that woman at tonight, you think? And where's Pharisee at tonight? Though religious. If you could hear them both where they're at, you sure take her place anytime. So no matter how religious you are, if you do, Jesus keeps every appointment, every commandment he, you have to answer for. So you better come now. If you haven't got the Holy Ghost, He commanded you to. He said in the book of Acts, Peter did. He said, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And as long as he's still calling, he's still giving the Holy Ghost. While we sing again, won't you come? That's my last time now. Remember, Christ has been here and you all raise your hands, identify that it was him and his word. And down that Christ in my heart is grief. Jesus set up over Jerusalem one time and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have hovered you as a hen does her brood, but you would not. A lot of times when I come amongst, as I told you this morning in the breakfast, you find Pentecostal people and all kinds of people. When I come among you, and the Holy Spirit down in me is saying, how off would I have gathered them? How the church had been standing today in its power, but you would not. See, you would not. Won't you do it now? This is the time. Lay aside every weight that's the sin that does easily beset you. Let's run with patience the race that's set before us. While we call one more time, Everybody sing with me now. Get right up and come up here. If you haven't got the baptism of the Spirit, if you're a sinner, backslider, whatever you are, come on up and let's pray together. Will you now? This is our last call. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for. back there, what would he do? Come home. Come home. He's sinned his way, day away. Will you do the same thing? What if that courier boy could stand before him again? What would be the first thing?
have you passed that place? Is there still a tender spot in there? If there is, come, let him come in. Take it over right there. He'll make you a new creature. You'll go in here the happiest person you ever was. Calling oh sinner. Whether her head's bowed, now let's hum it. You are weary. Oh, backslider, come on. This tenderly. Are you concerned? If you're convinced, then you're concerned. But if you're not convinced yet that it's Jesus, then you can't be concerned. Come on. Right here in the public, you can't do too much about us. If you come to make a confession, somehow go a personal story as you're listening to There's a man standing for he crossed the nation here many great revivals. The dream that he had a dream one night that he died. And he, he started into heaven and he was met at the gate and he said, Who approaches? And he said, This is Dan Mark. He said, I'm an evangelist. The man at the gate said, Let's see if your name shown in the book he said it isn't. He said, Well, I was a minister, so I can't help what you were. If your name's not on here, you can't hear the story. Just like high car showing you now. You have to have a name on the book. And he said, well, what can I do? He said, you might appeal your case if you want to to this God's white throne judgment. Oh, brother, sister, don't ever want to go there. So he said, I guess I have no other alternative but to see you on my case. So he said, look like he just started going somewhere. He didn't know where he was at. This is the man's dream. He said, I would come into a light. There's no certain place he was coming for it. But it got slower and while I stopped. I heard a voice said, who approaches my throne of justice? justice? He said, I, Danny Martin. He said, I'm an evangelist in the United States. He said, I, 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 I won souls. And I, they wouldn't let me in the gate. He said, all right, if you've appealed your case to stand in my courts. He said, then I require justice. He said, I have the commandments. He said, Danny Martin. Did you ever lie in your life? He said, I thought I'd been a truthful man. But said, in the presence of that light, I realized that said some things of shame. He said, uh, yes, sir. I told lies. He said, did you ever steal? He said, uh, I thought I'd been honest, but I'd seen some deals then. Wait till you get in the presence of that light. You think you're all right now, but just wait till you get there. Try to approach you one time with Bob Hare. Smoking cigarettes. Just try it one time. If you think I'm just saying that, I'll prove it to you out of the scripture here. Exactly right. Try it. Wearing a pair of slacks, shorts. Find out where you're at when the Bible says it's an abomination in the sight of God. Try it one time. Where's your conscience? He said, Well, did you ever do this or that? Yes, he said. And Danny, did you ever sin? He said, Yes, I see. And he's just about to hear, he said his bones looked like it was coming out of the joint to hear that. Depart into everlasting hell from my presence. He said he heard the sweetest voice he ever heard. He said he looked around and see it. He said he's seen the sweetest face that he ever saw. He said he said, Father, that's true. Then he tried to live in everything that he knew how to live, but he did do wrong. But one thing he did, down on earth, he stood for me. He stood up for me. Tuck up for me and all my word. Now I'll stand for him here. That's what you're doing now. You're making a stand for him here. He'll make a stand for you before the Father. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll be merciful. And grant the forgiveness of these people's sins. They've come here to make a stand. They each want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Grant it, he'll be given to them. I claim that, Lord, for your glory. While they stand before this audience as a witness, some of them are church members. Some of them are backsliders. Some of them have never accepted you before. And they're standing here. And they see the dirt that follows a real true Christian confession. And they're ready now to take their stand as that woman. 
who confess their sinners, but with their tears of repentance, they want to wash the dirt from your name, Lord. But grant that they can do it. I'm going to ask you one thing. Lord, we'll be out here before the public. We got to provide right back here. If you run here to see I want you to go back before we go back there with you. Come right up the step like this and go right here. We need that one more. Come right here. God, bless you. Come right up the step. God bless you. If there's some more, we're going to come right now. I'll hear the Lord. I want everyone's hand to come out. We'll go back there and meet you. This night is good for this. Now is the time to receive the Holy Spirit. If you ever received it, this is the time to come out and receive it. This is the time to give life to God. You stood here to make your stand. Now you want to see if you want to stand for you again. Right. The Lord bless the baby. I believe they're really deeply sincere. I believe this will be the greatest night we've seen in Tampa in a long time. Want somebody else to come follow me now? That's the first one. Workers back there with the tags on them. Going in with them. We're going in there just in a few minutes to be right with them there. You know, on the inside of the you better get back there and meet them as you go. You better be separated in your room. Won't somebody else come right quick while they're going down? Just stand right out. Would you let Jesus set in this day? You say, if I sit back there, if I'm seen like that, I would have done that. What about it back Your own present attitude identifies what you've done, man. The attitude you take now, you feel like that you're well enough. All right, that's between you and God. I'm not no judge. I'm just responsible for the word. These here are these. They come out of churches too. But they're going to settle it right now. It's all of it. They're ready. Why do you want to live a halfway Christian life? Or either be for God or be against it. So the world will know your colors and know where you stand. God bless them as they go. They're going in just like to die out to themselves. They're going to give their life. They're going to Calvary. They're going to be crucified to the things of the world and the fashions of this glamorous day we're living in. They're going to die to Jesus Christ whose presence is here right now. They're going to die to themselves to be born anew to Jesus Christ. God bless them. Is there someone else who come while we sing a little bit Earnestly
She's got a great big tumor on the inside of her. It's very bad off. She'll believe she can be healed. She just come in. Her name is Miss Turner. You believe with all your heart, now. Huh? Jesus Christ will make you well. You believe it? You believe it, God? Are you a stranger? You don't have no prayer card, do you? You just come in today. Somebody come and got you. You come down here from the state of Oklahoma, Georgia. You believe now? It's, it's God, your son, come and got you. All right? Now, you know it's totally impossible for me to know that. Of course, you just come in just a while ago and sit down here. That's right. Raise up your hands. See? Now, the same Holy Spirit is saying that. It's just pumping against the people right here. Hallelujah. See, he's identified, folks. Don't, yes. don't do that. Don't do that. You're, doing, you're making a rational mistake. Amen. I love you. Remember, you come to hear it. I appreciate that. Love is correct. You see your kid out here in the street. You just say, just say, Junior, you ought to do that. You'll go out and make him stay in. If you love him. Love is correct. You're not patting him. I have to scold you. Remember, it's even your offerings and things that pay for this meeting. It makes it possible for her to be here. Do I love you? With all of my heart. Sister, you might think I, I've got something against you for doing the things you do. It is that I have anything against you, sister. It's my godly love for you. Someone said, if you was a little bit younger, you wouldn't think that. I thought this when I was 14 years old. The Bible says so. It's the same thing. Don't make that mistake. Don't you trust in speaking in tongues for the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost speaks in tongues, but don't you trust that in doing the things that you're doing? Dancing in the spirit is some kind of sensation. Christ is a person. Certainly. And he's the word. And if he's in there, he always makes his word work just exactly the way it's supposed to. When you turn it down, how can it be Christ? Come home. Come home. The door is still open. Remember, at the judgment, I am not guilty. You are weary. Jesus Christ identified among you. Proving that that same spirit. He said, in the days when the Son of Man will be revealed. He's the same yesterday. The very same Jesus if set with dirty feet. Would he back up a hypocrite? Would he back up somebody who didn't know his word? That's identification that does know the word. I'm telling you the truth. Don't pass it. Come on. The last time. I'm saying you're ready to meet you. The rooms are plenty of room in there. People are nailed everywhere. You are weary. Come home. God have mercy. Have mercy. Can't you feel that? Breathe it. Earn. Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh, sinner, come home, Smoking's not a sin. Drinking's not a sin. Cursing is not a sin. Committing adultery's not a sin. No, no. That's attributes of unbelief. You do that because you're not a believer. There's only two. One, you are a believer or you're not a believer. If you're not a believer, no matter how religious you are, you're still a sinner. You're still a sinner if you don't accept every word of that Bible. Every word of it. Or both heavens and earth will pass away, but not one child or one tittle will pass from that. And we'll give an account for it. You say, well, I belong to church, my people belong. I don't matter how to do this, I don't care what you've done. You're either a believer or a sinner. That's pretty strong. But I'm just saying this because the same one that knows the hearts of you is telling me to say it. Are you finished? I see you. Two more coming. 
I'm just waiting because I don't know it. It might be somebody else. Just one moment. Why don't you come get in while the water's troubled now? We have great things just in a few minutes back here. Come, won't you? Raise up from there. Make your bow to God. Lord God, forgive me for what I've done. I promise you, I've said I was a Christian, but Lord, something in me tells me I, 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 I'm condemned right now in the presence of this one that's identifying himself as the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm condemned right in my own heart. And knowing it, him you're making this so plain. I'm condemned. I'm going in to make this right right now. I'll pledge both right here that from this night on, I'll absolutely live for him. Why don't you do that? All right. Wow. If that's all, now let's stand up with you out there just a minute. I wish I could sing. I'd like to sing that song. Forgive me, Lord, and find me no more. I'll be yours, dear Lord, if you'll be mine. If I fall or if I fail, let me rise and try. Forgive me, Lord, and me one more time. How many out there now as Christians and believe that you're anchored in Christ and you're ready for the coming judgment? And you'll be able that when the trumpet sounds, there won't be one thing to do but be caught away. It'll be done so quick you won't have time to read nothing else. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, what will it be one of these days? What if you missed it? There's forever, for eternity, forever, ever, ever. What will this little time of worldly pleasure mean? Nothing. Now I think we all are to dedicate our lives out here to Christ. Don't you think so? How many like to rededicate your lives upon this tonight? I'll rededicate myself right now. Lord, now think of what the what your besetting sin is. And let's just raise our hands now to God. Each one in your own way. Remember, He's omnipresent. While there's uh, maybe 1,800 or 2,000 praying in here, there's millions of praying around the world at the same time, and He hears every one of them. There's not even a sparrow can fall in the street, but what He knows that He knows every secret of your heart. Let's all pray now in our own way. Let's dedicate ourselves to Christ. Lord Jesus, uh, I, I'm, your presence was so great just a few moments ago that I could hardly even catch my breath. It seemed like it, I was going to leave. And I know that there's some reason that you want this done this way. I, I don't understand it, but you do, Lord. You're God. But you've clearly identified yourself. You're here. We believe you. We know you're here. And here in the building is hundreds of hands up. We're dedicating ourselves anew. Lord, upon this pulpit where I've preached and seen you stand here identifying yourself this week. I, I, I reconsecrate myself. I dedicate myself anew to your service. Forgive me of all my complaints about being tired. And, and, and oh God, just take me in your arms. Take all of us, Lord. Pack us away from this worldly care and these worldly things, Lord, that we might be holy, consecrated, dedicated service of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant it, Father, hear us tonight. Bless those back there seeking for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. May there come a sound again from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. May it fill every person in there with a fire from off the altar of God. Grant it, Lord. We praise you. We give you thanks and praise for, for receiving us. We give you thanks and praise for your people. We praise you because you said, if we'll confess our sins, God is just to forgive them. Grant it, Lord, that we'll all be forgiven. And tomorrow we'll see the greatest healing meeting this country's ever seen because of our confession. Grant it, Lord, we consecrate ourselves to thee in Jesus Christ. Amen. Just consecrate yourselves to God. Every part in there. I'm going to ask Brother Cox now, one of your pastors, here, to continue the prayer.